Welcome, everyone. Um, really glad to see so many uh, people for our final panel, which uh, is a bit the elephant in the room, which we've touched upon uh, throughout the today and oh, yesterday, yeah. which is the question of uh, European integration in the new geopolitical environment. And um, if we look at this year's development, we have probably all wished uh, for a different uh, situation after the end of the pandemic, which we purposely have now uh, to see, but um, things have turned out otherwise. And um, after Russia has expanded its aggression against Ukraine into a full-scale war on 24th February, it also shattered Europe's post-Cold uh, post War security order by doing this. And uh, it has become clear that as the continent's peace project, the European Union has, of course, delivered stability and security for its members. But beyond the realm of membership, the situation remains much more fragile. Nevertheless, most actors in Europe argue these days that the developments have increased the urgency uh, among the member states of finalizing the European project and getting the struggling enlargement process back on track. And probably one could argue that one of the signs that this is happening is that Ukraine and Moldova are the first countries after uh, a very long time who have received uh, a candidate status and a perspective to become members of the European Union, uh, which they had hoped for for quite long and not received before. And if we look at the speech that Chancellor Scholz delivered um, in Prague at the Charles University, he also underlined that for the Western Balkan, process, uh, Western Balkan enlargement process, after two decades, that words have to be followed by deeds by now. So for us, the question is today, what does the changing geopolitical situation mean for European integration and the Berlin process? And how can the current momentum be used to make the process uh, into a progress that was lacking so far? And I'm glad that I can discuss this topic with, uh, with our gra great panel. And um, Tommy Milton and me will be uh, hosting the panel and moderating it uh, together today. And um, I would like to welcome um, our guest online, Ambassador Frédéric Mondoloni, who is with us here from um, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Mondoloni is Director for Continental Europe at the French Ministry. Uh, he's a career dip diplomat. He has served on many different positions in his career, among them as Deputy Diplomatic Advisor to the Prime Minister, Diplomatic Advisor to the Minister of Defense and Ambassador to Serbia. Uh, Welcome, Frederik Mondoloni. I also welcome Manuel Zarazin, who is uh, the German government special representative for the countries of the Western Balkans. Uh, before taking his post, uh, Manuel has been involved in the region for quite a long time. He's been a member of the Bundestag for 13 years and also spokesperson for the Green Party uh, for Eastern European policy. Welcome, Manuel. Great to have you here. And for civil society, we have three representatives today who um, somehow present the opinions of different fora that have taken place uh, in recent weeks. And um, I'm, of course, very happy that Simonida Katsaska is with us, who is our rapporteur for the working group um, of the, uh, the topic we're discussing today. Simonida is director of the European Policy Institute in Skopje. She has a PhD in political science, more than 17 years experience as a scientist and a practitioner in the field, and she will introduce the civil society's recommendations in the field of European integration. Welcome, Simonida. Hello. Um, I also welcome Albert Hani, who is the Secretary General of RICO, which is often called one of the most important results of uh, the Berlin process. Albert is a civil society activist with more than 22 years' experience I took from your website in, in the <laughs> sector. <It's> more now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you told me it's more. And uh, he will share with us the insights from the Youth Forum, which is taking place in parallel and which is often discussing very similar issues we're having here. So looking forward to hearing about this, Albert. And last but not least, uh, for the CSO and Think Tank community, I welcome Jana Yusova, who is here from Prague. She's working as a senior research fellow and head of the Global Euro program at Europeum Institute in Prague. And her institution recently organized the EU Enlargement Think Tank Forum in the realm of the ongoing Czech Council presidency that took place, um, I think, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And Jana will reflect on the civil society forum recommendations against the backdrop of the recommendations that were made at this forum. 
So uh, welcome to all of you and looking forward to the discussion. And how we are going to structure um, this uh, rather large panel um, is going to be that we first hear from Simon Nida the recommendations um, from the civil society and think tank uh, process, and then we will have a first round um, of comments um, on those recommendations um, on the panel. And then we will have two rounds of discussions on two different topics. Uh, the first one is going to be on EU enlargement and the second one on the future of the Berlin process. And this is also the point when we would like to ask you to come up here and take um, the hot seat, so to say, um, to uh, integrate you into uh, the discussion. And then um, we will wrap it up um, with a short um, summary in the end. Uh, we all have to be very, very time uh, considerate um, to get through this. And um, without further ado, um, I hand over to Simonida. We are very much looking forward to your recommendations. Thank you, Stormy, and thank you, Christian, for the kind introduction. I have a very ungrateful uh, role to actually summarize in uh, seven minutes, I was told, the discussions that took place over the two days on the 19th and 20th of October uh, in the group on European integration where we had more than 70 people registered at a certain point. Uh, and um, I want to thank my colleagues at the European Policy Institute in Skopje that helped us in organizing the group back uh, then, and that worked in um, devising the three pages of recommendations that you both all have seen uh, here. Uh, rather than um, uh, trying to uh, divide the recommendations by the addressee or what do we want the EU to do, what do we want the Western Balkans or the CSOs to do, I'd rather combine them in four topics and two crazy ideas. Um, so, as you will have seen, we have a bit of an equal number of recommendations to all of these uh, three groups because we feel that we all have a shared interest here and we all have our own work to do. It's not just the European Union or just the Western Balkan countries, but there's a lot for uh, us as well. Uh, but uh, my four points are related to the changed geopolitical environment, which is something that we have in the title, the modalities of EU accession, um, then the fundamentals and the topic of convergence. And then the two crazy ideas are at the end, but we'll get back to them later. I, I don't want to dis disclose them this at this point. This is a cliffhanger, point. you know? Sorry? This is a cliffhanger. <laughs> I know it's a cliffhanger, I know. But what you told me, we'll discuss that later. Uh, first, the changed geopolitical environment. The discussions over those two days uh, really conveyed the sense that civil society felt that everything did change after the 24th of February. But to the EU side, there was still a bit of, a, there was still hesitation whether we've actually seen an actual shift in the EU enlargement process. So there was a much pervasive feeling that something needs to change more. We need to, and I think this goes back to what was the discussion here uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous section, uh, in the previous session, to end a pervasive cycle of disappointment that we have had for a very long time now. Um, this, was, this is probably the, the first recommendation that's, to hit, that's uh, targeted at the European Union, but at the same time, our Western Balkans governments need to also recognize that the geopolitical situation has changed. And in this sense, we do appeal for alignment with the CFSP in this context, but also to promote the cooperation with the new candidates, because this is something that we've not mentioned uh, before previously, because there are new candidates in the EU accession process, and we need to figure out how do we deal with these new realities. This is part of uh, the big changes that happened. Civil society organizations in this context do have a big responsibility to create more pressure on the governments to deliver on what we said, uh, what we discussed uh, before. Uh, also to reach out to our counterparts in the new candidates, because I think that this creates a, a different setting for us, for our work. Um, and to stand for, wide, for an advocate for one voice on the side of the European Union on many of these uh, matters. So there's a lot um, in terms of the changed geopolitical environment, but the, the, the end goal and the end demand by most of the organizations was that we really need to see something changing. And I think this goes back to what was discussed uh, before. As to the second point, uh, which is the big topics of the modalities, forms, shapes, initiatives of various EU accession uh, topics. Um, the appeal to the EU was to ensure that accession has no alternatives. And uh, while there was a sense of appreciation of many other initiatives, there was an appeal to the European Union member states to actually be very clear that all of these initiatives are complementary 
they contribute to the one goal that we have, and that is accession, because next year we're going to have, is it now 20 years from the Thessaloniki Declaration, and we really need to go back to that essential promise, which was repeated enough times during this year that it's still, uh, it's still valid. So in this sense, um, we need to ensure also on these grounds the, short, the closer sectoral integration of the region, be it through gradual, staged, or whatever forms of accession that we see, but we need to see something happening a bit earlier than uh, the enlargement date uh, as, um, as the end goal. This goes in terms of the obligations for the Western Balkan countries. Uh, we also feel that they need to clearly underline that all of these initiatives also contribute to the end goal, to accession. So we see this goes also to the inclusiveness of regional cooperation matters to use the existing uh, stimuli provided by the, co regional co the common regional market and to work towards building common positions uh, in, in the region on uh, various topics where uh, we see divergence in this sense. The third point is to go back to the basics on democracy and fundamental rights. Because we heard here on the previous panel this, uh, the, uh, this afternoon, where we had our colleagues uh, discussing rule of law matters, we have too, experienced too often in the past preferences or primacy given to stability issues, to bilateral issues which have uh, hijacked the accession process. We really feel that there is a need to go back to the fundamentals as they are, as they were foreseen to be in the accession, in the accession process, to prevent downgrading of democracy, rule of law, but also fundamental rights. And I'm mentioning here this last element because this there was a, an appeal on the side of civil society to really look closer into implementation uh, of protection of human rights mechanisms with a focus on vulnerable groups, including uh, specifically uh, mainstreaming gender, but also LGBTI rights, rights of Roma and people with disabilities. Because I think that that's something that we not did not mention enough over these two days, uh, probably. Um, on the same uh, vein, in terms of democracy and fundamental rights, we do see, we, as you will have seen, we have a strong obligation or pressure on the national governments to actually deliver on these, uh, on these same topics, but also we put an obligation on ourselves that we need to mon more closely monitor and evaluate and support uh, the inclusion of these various vulnerable groups that we considered in the EU accession process. The fourth point is the question of the convergence, because we are very well aware that um, these, all of these uh, engagements need to come with a much more higher investment on the side of the EU than what is the case uh, now. Um, on the other hand, our governments, there is an appeal to actually build the absorption capacity because the standard argument that we get, and it's a very, it's a very, co it's a very rational argument, is that you don't even use up of what is on the table now. So we do have a lot of responsibility on our side to actually provide for sounder projects and to build capacity for uh, their usage. And at the same time, there's a responsibility on civil society to provide the monitoring. I think that this was something that was discussed uh, before. These were the four points, the two crazy topics. Yes, the cliffhangers. I. I'm conveying here the sense of everyone. So there was a prevailing need for a date, some date, date within a lifetime, be it 2030. There's what? The a date? date for accession. What? I thought you wanted we'll a date. We'll go back. No. <laughs> <laughs> a date for the accession. We know, I'm, I, I myself was very much opposing to dates, but given that I've spent and I was told here 17 years or 20 something since I started to work, or no, 18 since I started to work, there's really a sense of a common date for accession, a common agenda that would actually commit both the union, commit the governments, but also increase the costs of non compliance. When? This was 2030 in the. 2030. That, that, that happens randomly to be the Macedonian government date oh, as six. well. A joint accession, a joint common goal of 2030. Now, we all know it might not be feasible. Goal or fixed date? Sorry? Goal or fixed date? A goal. So not a fixed date. But a date, we need a date as a goal. Hmm. 2025 was occasionally mentioned. So now you can, you can see I'm very, not very strict on it, but, but an agenda, I see Surjan here. I know this was one of his key ideas, so I need to convey <laughs> the sense of the group. Do not laugh, we need a date. A, a date is in a calendar date, yes. Lastly, the QMV issue. Um, 
we would not be, we, I, I was inspired here by our colleague that moderated the Roma panel, I'm ending here, Christian. She said that it's on our, we have the responsibility to dream and to make a better place of uh, the world here. So there is also the request for the QMV in foreign policy and to make EU decision making less of a hostage to certain uh, bilateral member states' interests. I'm looking, people look at me, strangely qualified majority voting as opposed to uh, key consensus in many of these uh, policies. Keeping in mind the merit, that goes on the date as well, maintaining the merits of the process, but there's a prevailing sense that people need to see a perspective within their lifetime rather than their grandchildren's lifetime. And I'll end here. And Thank the crazy you. ideas now? These were the two crazy ideas. Mm. Thank you very, very much, Simonina, for this uh, very concise um, and proposing a date, um, whatever that date <laughs> means. Um, and um, now we would love to hear from Albert um, if that resonates um, with what you discussed also at the Youth Forum and if you also discussed um, accession ex enlargement and also dates. Oh, oh my God, the, <laughs> actually our forum is, uh, has not yet finished, the declaration is uh, not ready, but I, I tried to pick up some of the uh, key points from uh, there. Uh, the, the, the main messages are, of course, uh, I would say similar. Young people are also wa waiting for deliverables by the uh, governments. They want uh, the commitments already given to be implemented, but uh, for more uh, it is believed that uh, this, with this Berlin process now, there is a need for renewal of this uh, commitment or, or uh, renewal of uh, the, uh, the, the, the interest or willingness of our political leaders to the Berlin process and by that to the uh, well-being and prosperity of the Western Balkans. This is, maybe, uh, this is something that uh, youth and, of course, RICO is considering it as a, uh, very important, especially having in mind that, uh, yes, even in the uh, last session was mentioned that uh, youth are willing to go out of the region. We have also statistics that are showing that, uh, the deterioration of the situation. I mean, uh, yes, more, more than 40% of the youth in the region don't feel that the education system is uh, good, is providing something what they are uh, in need. Uh, this shows that uh, the youth are looking also for other possibilities elsewhere. I mean, there are also statistics related to the uh, trust towards the leaders of the region of Western Balkans, to which they also say that, uh, yes, they see them as a factor for, for peace and uh, stability in the region, but at the same time, the, they really lack trust uh, among uh, leaders, in, in, uh, in, in leaders in general. So, uh, all these things are, are uh, leading us to a position to say that um, Western Balkans lost a lot of time by focusing a lot on, on differences, but at the same time, with the new, uh, let's say, Berlin process, we see similarities brought on the table, we see agreements brought on the table, we see the stakeholders working on the agenda that contributes directly to the future of uh, youth, literally by focusing on what I said, the education system with the diplomas or, or with the movement. Uh, these things give a, a great hope to youth. Uh, and yes, the achievements of the Berlin process, one might say that uh, one might un undermine them, but I don't think that uh, we should be seeing them as something that uh, doesn't contribute to our societies because in the end of the day, youth are coming with a completely other positive energy. I mean, the other conference that we are organizing there, uh, I would say, comes with willingness to make fast changes and maybe not even relate them to the dates. They see changes now and uh, here, and they want to be part of the changes. They want to be part, integrated part of the changes and not just overlooked sentences or, 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 uh, or, or uh, boxes in, uh, it, uh, that need to be 
ticked into, into some important doc, document. They want a meaningful participation in decision making. They want to be part of even what was discussed here, the green agenda. They called it the green mentality, which will be uh, how it was said, uh, yeah, a green mentality for youth that, that goes be, beyond, be, behind just understanding youth as a target group, but they want to be part of the solutions. They believe that the era of uh, young, young people be, being seen as a problem should be uh, faded out, should be gone, and they, should, they are willing to see themselves as a partner among all stakeholders that are dealing or designing the future of region of Western Balkans. They want to, uh, a meaningful contribution, and of course this uh, uh, is all the time RICO trying to do. We really try to do our best by connecting all the youth from the region. Over 30,000 youth in the region are, are connected through our uh, activities in different uh, projects, and these are all things that give hope to them that yes, some things are moving forward. And luckily we have friends like uh, Manuel here that uh, uh, really Europe needs more people like, like uh, Manuel. I mean, I, took, I, I apologize, I took you as an example, but with people that love the region of uh, Western Balkans and want to see it integrated as soon as possible and, uh, and by that accelerate the process of integration into the uh, European Union. Yeah. Now th this, is, this sounds really great. So um, youth isn't disengaged and disillusioned, but they really want to change and there's great energy coming from youth. Uh, that, is, that is very positive to hear. And we will pick that up later on again, I'm very sure. Um, so Jana, you were responsible or in part responsible for the EU Enlargement Think Tank Forum, where you looked specifically um, on enlargement. So tell us a little bit about the results um, of that process and if that also resonates with the recommendations we uh, just heard. Okay. Uh, so, um, as we opened with the discussion about how the geopolitical environment in which the EU enlargement process is taking place actually has changed with the war in Ukraine and the high expectations which were actually placed, and I think it was caused also by the rhetoric because we heard a lot about geopolitical decision, geostrategic decision which is needed in terms of EU enlargement process. And um, unfortunately, I have to say that uh, our event was also marked by some level of disappointment that um, we still are hearing these remarks, but we are still waiting for uh, the actual steps and concrete actions to materialize. Uh, so, um, as, as uh, you mentioned, our uh, EU Enlargement Forum uh, was actually focused specifically on EU Enlargement, and uh, that's uh, quite a different component, and that will also impact uh, my contribution here. Because, uh, naturally, us coming from Czech Republic and EU member states, we don't feel qualified and legitimate enough to be giving advice to Western Balkan uh, leaders or civil societies. Uh, so, uh, we focused uh, on the EU and the EU side and what the EU and individual EU member states can actually do to deliver on their end of the, of the process and the problem that we are seeing currently. And uh, there was a lot of talk uh, in these past two days about the role of fundamentals and uh, that despite the geopolitical situation and the huge shift which we are experiencing, still the fundamentals, the rule of law and democracy and respect for human rights are the fundamental uh, issues and values that should be respected. They actually lie at the core of the whole process since the beginning. And that was the same sentiment that was shared in Prague. Uh, that um, uh, sometimes, and I have the feeling from my uh, practice, that sometimes we are seen because we are proponents of EU enlargement and advocating for the process to continue, that uh, somehow we want uh, some concessions, that um, we are advocating that the conditionality shouldn't be maybe so strict and that we should advance with enlargement process regardless of uh, the low level of preparedness of the candidate countries. But I think uh, your conclusions and our conclusions actually show that this is not the case, that we are the advocates civil society and think tanks, we are the advocates for the strict conditionality of the European Union. But in the same time, uh, what I'm observing on the EU side and among EU member states is that um, there are concerns naturally, and we are more seeing it in the past few years, um, about the process not delivering on the democratic uh, processes and the democratization actually in the region and uh, the democratic backsliding. 
And uh, the, the mechanism to cope with that is, uh, or seems to be somehow to increase the conditions at the point of uh, entrance, basically accession to the European Union in the accession process. And uh, what we are currently seeing is that the conditionality and the concrete conditions are becoming a moving target. So they are not very predictable. They are not uh, stable. They are somehow developing according to uh, different EU member states' demands. And uh, to some extent, it can be frustrating, of course, and it can contribute to slowing down of the process at the site of the Western Balkan countries or in general candidate. And now when we have uh, new candidates from Eastern Europe. And uh, my argument here would be actually that uh, while, uh, of course, strict conditionality at the entry point is necessary and it should be um, monitored well, uh, evaluated well and demanded, in the same time, we have to continue the discussion about the rule of law mechanisms within the European Union. Because me coming from uh, Czech Republic, a Visegrad country, we are bashed <laughs> quite a lot uh, by especially some older EU member states for our own deficiencies in terms of rule of law and democracy. And uh, very often we are hearing that uh, the state of uh, rule of law and issues in Hungary and Poland are actually one of the reasons why there is such a huge mistrust and skepticism among some, uh, especially Western European uh, can, uh, member states, uh, towards future enlargements. And uh, I have to argue that uh, when Hungary was joining the European Union, probably no one could have envisaged, envisaged sorry, uh, could have foreseen uh, what it would become at this point. And so even if we have very strict conditions um, uh, during the accession process, then it also has to be somehow matched by the mechanisms within the European Union towards its own member states. And this will be the only safeguard for uh, the older EU member states or the skeptical EU member states that uh, similar, uh, similar examples as Hungary and Poland won't follow. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. Um, I would now like to um, hand over to Frederick, um, because we also know that you do have to leave um, very soon. Um, again, you heard from the Civil Society Think Tank Forum, we heard from the youth, um, and we also heard um, uh, a little bit of criticism towards the EU enlargement process, um, that there sometimes there also might be a moving target. Um, so what do, you, what, what do you think about what you have heard uh, so far? Does it resonate? And is it, is it well, enlargement is a two-way street, right? So we have to do our homework, others have to do our homework, and where do we meet in the middle? Great, great. Well, first of all, I, um, I hope you, are, you can hear me well. Perfect. And uh, great, great. So if it is the case, first of all, let me first say that it's a pleasure to take part in this discussion with, with you, uh, even if uh, from Paris. And so uh, thank you, Simonida, for the presentation of the working group recommendation. And thank you for the, uh, for the discussion. Um, I think this resonates a lot. And I think a lot of criticism that you mentioned are, are very true and we deserve it. And we need to take that into account. And we need to hear and, and to learn from the civil society. Um, I, I'm not saying that because, you know, I just want to, 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 to make you think that uh, we are uh, hearing what was said, but because we, are, we, do we do think that it's very important to take that into account. Um, uh, on the enlargement policy as a whole and also on the proposal of, uh, of an indicative target date uh, for EU accession uh, of the Welcome Balkan country, uh, countries. Um, uh, on that, I would say that, uh, first of all, we agree that there is a need to introduce more dynamic in the process. And we are currently lack, um, we, are, we are currently lacking uh, lasting results, I would say, in terms of rule of law and social and economic uh, development in the framework of the accession process. That's why the, um, that was clearly the idea behind what we have proposed in 2019, 2020, which was the renewed approach for the accession negotiation, what we call more or less the revised, uh, revised methodology. I know this is not perfect, but this was the idea behind it, um, especially after the uh, European Council of the Fall uh, 2019. And uh, we wanted both to have uh, I will say more and more efficient system with concrete benefits uh, on the ground on the ground for the people and also with more gradual integration of the candidate countries and also uh, as you said uh, I think uh, as Jana said it for a, a little also to, to come back to the fundamentals 
with a much more rigorous, uh, I will say, um, and stronger political steering um, based on, on the uh, conditionality, uh, reversibility, and especially on the issue of the rule of law. So I think that was at the core of the, uh, of the issue at that time. Since then, I think we have made some progress anyway, even if, if of course, not, not, nothing is perfect. Um, uh, and also, uh, and this progress is, much, uh, is very needed now because we are, as it was described by Simoneda, um, in a real uh, different uh, geopolitical context, context uh, with, uh, of course, the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, for us, this is even more essential that uh, EU uh, increase its political, economic, security commitment in the Western Balkans. And we are aware uh, that is, is, it is even more important in this context to strengthen the credibility uh, of the Europe, European perspective of, of, the, of the region. I think this is very, very important. Uh, but um, uh, so I said that we, we, had, we had made anyway some, some, some progress. I know uh, we need to do more. But first of all, I would like to recall the opening of the uh, that we have pushed forward during the, the French presidency, the, some, some important issue. Uh, of course, uh, the holding of the first ICG uh, intercontinental conference with North Macedonia and Albania um, and the concrete opening of the accession negotiation on the uh, 19th of July was an historical moment. Uh, it was well deserved. Uh, of course, it was uh, awaited, uh, especially from the Macedonia, who waited for 17 years, which is much too long uh, for this outcome. Uh, I want to, to, to recall the efforts before us of the uh, German presidency, also Portugal, Slovenia, and of course of the current uh, Czech uh, presidency. Uh, so, first point. Second point, I would like also to, to underline what uh, the initiative that we took, uh, that we are calling European Political Community. Um, I think this project uh, responded to a need, uh, a need of a high level uh, political forum, which would gather countries for EU and, uh, from EU and also outside the EU, uh, willing to, to, to face, uh, I would say, um, and challenges, especially of course the challenges um, posed by Russian aggression, but not 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 only this one, uh, on an equal footing. And on this, on this, I think that the the Prague summit was very important. Uh, on that, I would like to underline uh, that first of all, it's not a competitor uh, competitive competitive, uh, um, uh, I would say, a forum. Uh, of the already existing institution. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is absolutely not the case. And also to make it crystal clear that this is not um, an alternative to enlargement. Uh, enlargement. This is uh, for us a way to, to promote uh, uh, increased uh, involvement and, and enlargement. And I think that the Prague Summit was also important to, to, to send a message of a united Europe, uh, which goes uh, until the very near border with, with, with Russia. Um, uh, I think I will maybe stop, uh, st stop, stop, stop there, but uh, it's true that uh, in this context, I think we have a lot of address to, a lot of uh, issues to, to address, sorry, uh, at the level of the continent. Uh, I mentioned, mentioned um, of all the, the, the challenges posed by the, the Russian aggression, but it's not only, I mean, we, we can think about resilience, energy, cybersecurity, youth migration, and I want also to to commend uh, what was done by the, with the Berlin process. I, I'm not sure I will be able to, to, to stay for the second round table. I just wanted to, 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 to make it clear that we do think this is a very important process. We need to support it. Uh, a lot has been made, a lot still remains to, 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 uh, to be made on all the issues that I mentioned. And I do think that uh, there is a real high value and the value added to this process, and we need to continue uh, after uh, the uh, summit tomorrow uh, on all the issues that I mentioned. We are, could also have mentioned green agenda, or of course reconciliation, and I will also to, to pay tribute to RICO and, and to uh, and to you, Albert, and your teams. Um, uh, I do think that this is very good examples, and um, reconciliation is, of course, at the heart of the regional cooperation. Uh, we are ready to continue to help you uh, get visibility and, and, and funding because we know that it, this is necessary. Mm.
Uh, I think I will stop there and will uh, uh, let uh, maybe Manuel has his words, uh, which is it's, it's good to be with you uh, even online. And um, and uh, Manuel floor is yours, I guess. But uh, and I hope uh, the remarks were were were, were useful. Thank you. Um, Frederick, before you jump off, um, Simonina also pointed at one very specific issue, um, and that is the decision making on a unanimous basis um, in comparison to what might be a better way, uh, majority voting. Could you maybe say a couple of words on that before you have to jump off? Yeah, this is very challenging. Uh, you know that uh, we already have uh, some major, uh, uh, majority vote on some issues, and not to mention, for example, visas and so on. And so I want also to to make it clear, I'm taking this opportunity to, to make it clear that uh, during the, uh, um, the, 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 the summit on the Western Balkans in Brussels, that we tried to, to organize during the presidency, the president made it clear that we are open to, 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 to move on the issue of visa for Kosovo, uh, for Kosovo. I think this is very important. So this is the kind of issue where the majority uh, rule can be very useful. On the issue like enlargement, um, uh, allow me to, to remain a little bit cautious uh, as we speak, because I do think that we also need an ownership of all the process by everybody. And we saw uh, last uh, spring uh, how it was difficult when we uh, had to deal with, um, with also with Ukraine and, and, and Moldova. Uh, and finally, I think the strength of this decision was uh, because it was taken unanimously, and uh, and uh, and also of course the same thing for the perspe European perspective for, for for Bosnia, which I do think was very important and is a little bit underestimated as we speak. I do think we need to to, to make it clear that this is really an important decision that was made, and uh, that we need to encourage the Bosnian leadership to to move along what was asked for uh, during the summit. Thank you. Thank you very, very much that you joined us uh, this afternoon. Um, and we very much hope that um, what you put on the table will in part be implemented. Um, Manuel, you have been very patient um, <laughs> waiting until now. And there is now a whole bouquet of um, recommendations and also expectations, some frustration and also some optimism on the table. Um, so please, the floor is yours. So can we agree on that everything what I say which is positive, everybody agrees, is on behalf of German government. Everything which is a bit more controversial is in my position as president of Southeast Europe Association. And if you have any complaints, go to Christian later. Um, so um, let's, let's make some, one private point, which I think is, is important to make. Um, I think the main point for holding member states, which are actually democracies, um, on the rule of law path is a strong ECJ. And uh, I believe that other mechanisms are well and fine. Uh, and this is my private opinion. But the only thing to really get this through is a strong ECJ. And this is not only valid for Hungary and Poland. This is valid for us all. Um, there's a general problem if you give the council too much power in judging others, which is also fine because, Frederick, as a private person, you see that sometimes even big member states have some problems with each other. And then everybody is somehow also lucky when they are friends again. <laughs> um, so in structure. And, <laughs> and in the European treaties, you would have the commission in a strong position. But of course, also decisions by the commission always need a legitimacy background by the council. I would perhaps put more to the commission than Frederick's government, but in general, it's always the outcome of both. So the main point is a strong ECJ. And also, if you talk about Hungary and Poland concretely, ECJ ruling so far has been the main basic. And if you want to talk about more tough regarding financial means, ECJ must be in the center. So why I'm saying this here first as a comment on you, you will not get countries under uh, auspicious of ECJ until they're member, probably. But also it means that the whole idea of the internal market, the European Union, the currency union, as united one space of law, it means that chapter 23, 24 are so key. And this means 
state succession, good ideas, but it all must meet this complaint. Or would you say it's great if you have a country perhaps even a bit worse than the state of art in Hungary is, country, is participating in all um, EU budgets but not doing anything? You would have the same argument like today for full membership. So it is about strong European institutions and the strong unity of the role of the European law being provided. Second is um, regarding qualified majority voting. I think it is really, really great to go there, and also my private opinion, but sometimes, like Frederick pointed out, it is also important that nobody uh, is sidelined and then uh, he can stand by the side and do throw stones all the time on the train where everybody is on. So it's a real tricky question where to go anemonious and where to go with qualified majority voting. Mm -hmm. In the reality in the European Union, it is in a way that in almost, I think about 90%, this is old data and from old knowledge, but in a, let's say in a, in a vast majority of uh, votings, even where you have as a voting method in the council, qualified majority voting, you would go in anemonious decision. Um, and I would say like sometimes council is overriding this, but there is a logic behind this in the council that should also not be neglected too much. So funny is that when Germany, which was in the Euro crisis, quite a lot dragging to get more veto positions itself, um, uh, is by Chancellor Scholz actively promoting qualified majority voting, which is good, suddenly small member states, which in former times usually uh, were bullied perhaps even by vetoes, are afraid of their national position might be neglected by putting out the veto. So let's go this path. I know that my government is trying to do so. It's really positive to hear about the French position. But this is not the question which will solve or dissolve the question of enlargement. Yeah, it is good when enlargement can contribute to feeding into this debate, but as soon as you link this debate as a precondition to enlargement, you would make a grand mistake, which you would usually not do this in the European Union. You would not say uh, this is a precondition for whatever next, the next MFF or uh, the next uh, Ukraine fund or whatever. Um, third, which, which I think is important, we have a problem that... Uh, uh, you know, the regatta principle is to a certain extent uh, not valid anymore or like in the wrong way. Sometimes you can be having the less merits and getting the most chapters opened. And we have to be more honest to each other um, on that and to be more strict on, on measures. But there's a region why we got more soft on this sometimes because the credibility of the process itself was dragged down. So if, you, if, if Simonida doesn't think that the date will ever take place, I mean the date, not the date, yeah. um, then of course the, the wanting to meet finally will be less. So we have to work on the credibility to also build back a better position for being strict sometimes. Yeah? So that it's really something which you take away by saying no instead of a, a felt loose promise which is taken away. But um, you know how to bring back European credibility and I strongly believe, I said this quite often, Christian knows the story already for a long time. Um, I'm a believer of the Schumann, uh, Schumann Frederick <laughs> method um, who said solidarity of action. Yeah. So we can talk about concepts and dates and we can talk uh, together, the, the one panel on open Balkans, Berlin process, concurrency or merging. The next, when is the right date for the date, to give the date? Well, what is the right date to say what is the date, by the way? Um, or we can just start delivering again. And I think this was the biggest weakness of the process in the last years. We were not delivering enough to be also tough and perhaps even sometimes unnice and to be attractive. And I hope that tomorrow will be one step where Berlin process with common regional market, where energy, with energy uh, questions, with also other topics, starts delivering again a bit more. I mean, it's a major breakthrough uh, for the current state of art, but of course it should not be the rest and the end, um, the end of it. Uh, the idea regarding uh, cooperation with the uh, counterparts in the you called new candidates, and I was wondering myself if you mean Bosnia and Herzegovina or future no. Kosovo. <laughs> no, yes, so she's the trio from what 
Now I think this is a great idea and probably uh, would be great also to have perhaps Südosteuropa Gesellschaft in that um, because I think that in the Western Balkans there's a major mistake done by underestimating the strengths of uh, Ukraine, the ability of politicians in uh, Moldova um, and the civil society in Georgia. And uh, when I hear sometimes politicians from Bosnia and Herzegovina, so not civil society, but politicians who were perhaps not so proactively organizing reforms the last years in Bosnia and Herzegovina, talking about Ukraine as a country lacking behind so far. And this is not meeting my impression of this country fighting this war with an intact administration by all shortcomings they have for sure. Um, and um, I'm convinced that thinking positively about each other is something which should be done between Western Balkans and um, the new candidates from, from, from the East. Um, and it would be great to also, I mean, the civil society in Ukraine is so unbelievable, marvelous, strong, and they have experiences which is so great and it would be really interesting to bring this together if they have time for. Um, because while not only having panels on NGO topics and dates, they also usually collect money for weapons and sometimes have relatives and friends dying at the front line every day. Um, but I think this could be something really, really helpful also to, to break through this argument from the region somehow. We have been stuck for, like North Macedonia, 17 years, and now suddenly Ukraine is coming. Um, Ukraine also was stuck quite long with an ideological argument to hold them out even. So they were not candidate for 17 years in waiting, but also the first Maidan in 2004 was a pro-European movement to a certain extent, and they, um, they were also waiting for some changes on our side. Um, yeah, this is perhaps uh, comments, comments to you, and perhaps one more point. Bye-bye, Frédéric. Merci beaucoup. Bye. Um, bye-bye, sorry, colleague, please. Bye-bye. Uh, the one question which is important, like what we reach tomorrow and then the implementation. Um, for the implementation of the reachings tomorrow, but also, of course, of other topics, uh, your work is massively important. And let's try to not only have a success tomorrow, but also if the success is realized tomorrow, um, be clear on that we go after and that one year later there is a clear status report to Sir, I, I better call not a report, but a clear assessment of what has been reached and where the shortcomings done and to be created some occasion, but also some instruments to put political pressure to, to also, um, you know, look at the shortcomings because probably there will be shortcomings also in this process and it's always, always a question how to deal with the shortcomings. Yeah, this was long enough because I have to leave more or less on time, so I shut up now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this very interesting first round of comments. Uh, we will continue now talking about uh, specifically the enlargement process before we move more to the Berlin process. And I would like to remind you that we also have the, the hot seat in this round. So probably we can, we can manage to include one or maximum two persons. So if you're fast, you can be this person to uh, jump on the panel and join the debate. For one moment, I was uh, hoping that Frederick was somehow hooked to our debate after hearing the recommendations and we could put one more question, but I would then just I was continue, too long for that. continue as planned. Uh, he wrote me an SMS that I should talk longer so he doesn't have to answer. <laughs> ah, okay, I see. <laughs> Secret diplomacy. You believe me. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so um, I would like to continue with Jana um, because uh, Frederick has also mentioned uh, the European political community and already underlined that it is not an, an alternative to enlargement and I would be interested in um, as it has taken place in Prague and as you have also discussed about it at your forum so how was this perceived um, is is this really the sense of complementarity that Simonida has mentioned that is important now um, or can it be aligned if there's not the sense of complementarity and probably also on the other point that um, that Frederick mentioned, the increasing credibility, where there's some ideas of how to achieve this, because this is actually a very big question. Yes, you are completely right. <laughs> this is the one million dollar, million dollar question. Uh, so regarding the EPC, um, I have to say that, uh, of course, there was naturally from pretty much everyone, I guess, who was dealing with EU enlargement, this concern a bit uh, and 
since we are speaking openly here, especially come when this idea came from the French, uh, then that was even more suspicion. Like, is this supposed to sideline enlargement process or what is this about? But uh, to be honest, uh, speaking for myself, uh, my worries were put aside uh, during the summit in Prague, the latest, because uh, I don't think uh, what we observed in Prague was uh, any ambition for replacing uh, of the enlargement process. And to be honest, there was very little ambition in the European political community as such. So um, to say uh, the truth, uh, what we saw or we really observed uh, in the uh, last few days or weeks upcoming to the summit uh, was the attempt of the Czech presidency and the Czech government as the organizers to actually completely clearly dissociate uh, the European political community summit and the EU as a whole. Uh, so there were very uh, surprising maybe statements um, about uh, how uh, the process itself and the summit actually has nothing to do with the European Union and it's a coincidence that the summit is taking place in Prague and so on. Uh, so even you know from this perspective, it would be difficult to actually somehow replace such an EU-centered initiative, EU policy, in fact, towards the region or now regions uh, with uh, this uh, very loose uh, intergovernmental platform for discussion, basically, uh, without any clear ambition per se. It's more uh, about just uh, having the opportunity to meet, to discuss topics which are currently urgent and so on. But uh, what I think is the most important question when we uh, discuss the fears uh, about replacing enlargement with the EPC is uh, why there are this, uh, these fears and these concerns. And I think actually this is very telling because there was the same situation with the Berlin process when it was initiated. Is this supposed to replace the enlargement process? So I think the cause for these fears is actually that there is no clear vision coming from the European Union about the goal of the enlargement process. Where is it going? Uh, are we sure? Because we are now actually seeing that we are lacking the consensus among the EU member states uh, regarding the future membership, actual membership, full membership of the candidate countries. Uh, and so on, and uh, it is tight, and we mentioned it here uh, to the internal EU reform. Uh, it revolves about uh, around the qualified majority voting, but there are actually more concerns to be addressed and more questions to be addressed if we talk about preparing the European Union for the EU enlargement and for growing with uh, several new states. Uh, and it comes also to the institutional setup. So how many commissioners we would actually have on what basis uh, the number of the members of the European Parliament would probably have to be regulated somehow and so on. And um, we touched upon it, but the, the discussion uh, about the internal reform is becoming more and more present, I would say. We are hearing more and more about it, and uh, it's good that at least now we are seriously discussing it. But uh, we also cannot expect and, uh, that it would uh, be concluded anytime soon. And uh, we really shouldn't uh, tie the enlargement process and its future uh, directly to the uh, internal reform taking place and being materialized. It has to go hand in hand. Of course, we need to be discussing this. It will be very sensitive and difficult discussion. So it will have to mature over the years probably. But in the same time, we should be looking for ways how to progress with uh, bringing these countries and these regions closer to the European Union. And here again, I go back to the uh, mentioned concept of the gradual or accelerated in or staged integration. Uh, so I think this is the only way. And it's actually not only in the interest of the candidate countries to integrate closer, closer with the European Union, but right now, and especially in the context of the war, we are seeing that it's very much in interest of the European Union to actually uh, make sure that uh, the EU is again uh, the, the main player in the region, that um, we actually coordinate better and deeper with these countries on the common challenges and so on. So um, I believe this, uh, this could be the way forward. We really have to figure out what our vision is. We have to be clear about it. But in the same time, in the meanwhile, because it's a difficult discussion, we should be looking for very concrete ways how to cooperate now in this situation. Okay, so I understand you a bit in a way that you, you see no complementarity, but also no threat because it's too vague in a way. Yes. And uh, increasing credibility would mean internal reform of the EU would probably be a big boost, um, but uh, increasing cooperation uh, would work and also having potentially a staged accession model that would allow for earlier inclusion. 
Basically, but also uh, if the European political community is not supposed to be a replacement, it has to be communicated clearly because uh, I don't have the fear anymore, but there are some people who have these concerns. So the European Union and the EU member states particularly have to be clear that we actually are talking about full integration. Mm -hmm. So please really don't be shy. That seat is open. And you don't want us to call on you to come up here. So do it voluntarily, please. <laughs> I didn't know we would do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't see any movement, serious. so... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jana. I would like to move to Albert then, who already mentioned the dynamism of the Youth Forum. And also we talked about this uh, when you said, okay, you had the feeling sometimes yesterday there was more of a gloomy mood here, whereas the situation was very optimistic at the Youth Forum. And maybe picking up one of the, the points that uh, Frederick made, that more dynamism should be put into the enlargement process. And everybody was pretty clear that qualified majority voting would not do the thing. Um, so what do the young people who are now, as we've said several times, voting with their feet uh, on the situation in the region and becoming individual members of the EU, um, if their countries don't become member states, uh, what can the EU and the Western Balkan governments do Uh, to make these young people more optimistic um, about their situation in the region and how to achieve more dynamism. Uh, thank you, Christian. I mean, the, the short, short answer for this would be really the key word, uh, hope. We shouldn't be playing with the hope, especially with the hope for, uh, that the new generations are in need for. The more we are skeptic, the more we are pessimistic and transferring negative energy to the youth, the more we give messages that uh, things cannot be changed in our region. We should be really uh, uh, optimistic, I, I, I think, and prize all what we do. I mean, we should be also thankful to all these civil society representatives here that uh, with their projects do a lot of changes over there. Mm -hmm. These are all things that are directly contributing to the hope of youth to uh, stay at least in the region, to see opportunities, to grab these opportunities and also to get responsibility to create new opportunities. By having possibility to, to study in a neighboring country now, after tomorrow when the agreements will be signed, this youth will be uh, having the opportunity to use this knowledge in the place where they are and not go elsewhere, be productive and contribute to a uh, different society. The best is if they contribute to in their society and if they themselves create more opportunities for their peers and for the next generations. But this can be done only if we allow ourselves to give more space to them in the decision-making processes, to give them space to be part of all levels of uh, discussion. We should be thankful also to uh, different initiatives uh, that, that are not just RCC and, uh, and RICO as intergovernmental organizations, but all initiatives around uh, that are dealing uh, with different topics like uh, the business sector, like uh, uh, even the media that do a lot of activities to keep this hope alive among, uh, among youth. Yes, the statistics are, are, are worrisome. I mean, our statistics show that 52% of youth want to go abroad. But uh, it, it, is, it is worrisome. But it is at the same time giving us a duty to care about the future of uh, youth. This is what they reflected in the, in the documents there. It is, of course, difficult to, to put people to co uh, cooperate. I mean, to put... Uh, To, uh, to cooperate people that are having differences, that are having different opinions on the, on the past or, or, or had undergone a violent conflict. Uh, this is a really a demanding job. And I can assure you it's not easy to put on a table uh, to, uh, to discuss important issues of uh, common interest, but with people that, that uh, are uh, uh, carrying the burden of the past. And this burden of the past is usually reflected with uh, stereotypes and, and prejudices. And, uh, uh, but the beauty of, of, uh, of this is... The beauty of this is dialogue. The beauty of this is also that we all together have to take responsibility. We all together have to uh, really see as a as, uh, uh, duty to care about dialogue in the future, about putting all these stakeholders that yesterday were seeing as enemies 
putting them on, on, on table. It's easy to work with like-minded uh, people. We, in a way, have really hard, uh, hard job to do in, in these regards. We, aware, we are aware that we are, in fact, pro, uh, uh, produ uh, challenging here the, the hope when they see that it is difficult to work on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, let's say, agreement on, 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 on acknowledgement of, of, of diplomas. It looks technical for, for, for youth. It looks like, oh my God, this happened somewhere in a very easy, uh, easy process. Of course, uh, the process is somewhere else can, can be easy, can be uh, cheaper, but uh, uh, the, the energy invo invested into coming into these uh, uh, documents, it's a lot. Knowing the context, knowing the burden of the... Uh, 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 of the people that have uh, related to the past and that youth are not actually, actually youth are the only immune target in this, uh, immune to stereotypes and prejudices in this, uh, in, this con in this context. Yet, when they cooperate in our activities, as I mentioned, 30, over 30,000 youth have cooperated, they pave the road even to, to, uh, to politicians, to our politicians in the re region, for better cooperation. Why I say this? Because once they cooperate uh, outside of, of these normal boundaries, what we uh, consider coming from stereotypes and prejudices, they, they don't care about those barriers. They care about uh, having a, a wealthy and happy life. Once politicians, our politicians, see this uh, energy among youth, it, it gives them more hope to cooperate even better. So we are welcoming all the activities that are making youth happy and uh, that are coming from civil society, from business, from international organizations, from, from, uh, from all the actors that are really interested on uh, the prosperity of the Western Balkans. Uh, I just want to mention one more thing. I mean, uh, it is important that all these initiatives are, are contributing to, to the hope, but uh, uh, we are also, as uh, RICO, uh, proud to have all the support that we need from, for now from the stakeholders, but at the same time from uh, the people that are caring about the region of uh, Western Balkans. At the moment, we are also trusted uh, to uh, administer the Western Balkans Cultural Fund, idea here again of our, our uh, uh, friends. Uh, these are small things that uh, need maybe a little bit of time. They maybe need, uh, maybe they are, they are seen as, as something that uh, uh, is ir irrelevant. But in fact, they are big steps forward because with these funds, with these activities that RICO and all the others are doing, we are, as, as I said, paving the road for uh, politicians to come easier to these, uh, to these uh, agreements and to do these agreements that, that before were seen as something complicated or they needed a big uh, courage to see them as real, real need and concern of the youth in, in general. Thank you very much. So I, I, I take improving the situation in the region in small steps, but still building up hope also by including youth into decision making and planning the future. Thanks. Um, we, we now have a, a little bit of a problem because <laughs> I really wanted to ask Simonida to talk about the, the accession date. Uh, but we also want to hear Manuel about the Berlin process and we have Jasna joining us. <laughs> um, Yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First we introduce Etias and then you can talk. <laughs> so we go ahead with... Since you, Manuel, introduced this um, uh, speaking in private capacity, I just felt triggered by the panel uh, to maybe share something which is specifically related to youth. Uh, from, from my experience working in the region and on the region now in, in Brussels, um, what youth really needs is a, is a chance uh, to do what it can. And that chance is, is really necessary to be given by the Western Balkan governments. Not only the youth that is linked to certain political party in power, but all youth. Without that chance, they really leave. I had, um, I had an opportunity even last night to see some of them. The, the best and the brightest have been trying and trying and trying. And at the end, they moved to Berlin because they were given a chance to do what they can do. And I think this is really important. And the second point that I want to say, what we as, as, as the EU, when we engage with youth, 
um, uh, on the topic of reconciliation, what really works is, again, to give them the chance to do what they want to do and, region, and gathering them across the region. We did that with young journalists recently. It worked miracles. We didn't call it reconciliation, but at the end of them spending time together, learning journalism from the best journalist in the world, that was the part of the project, we realized at the end of the consequence, but this was really the aim, they also reconciled and reached the shared understanding of the past because they gathered on the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the war in, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for example. And, and it was a genuine operation in which they just spent time together, uh, learned together, learned from each other and while learning journalism primarily. So one thing that really works for youth is not really having another conference on reconciliation, but give them the opportunity to do, you know, if there are architects, gather them around architecture, artists around art, if there are journalists around, you know, mastering what they want to do. And then around that, basically everything else they figure out and, uh, and, and share the, the and, and reach the shared understanding of the past, of the current situation and what they need to do in the future. It's a great resource and it really works, which I, as, as last night, I also want to be a bit more op optimistic. Thank you. Thank you. The optimism. Thank you very much for this, Jasna. Um, so uh, just uh, for, for the final question of, of the enlargement part, Simonida, it would be great, as you two have been discussing about this already, uh, if you could tell us a bit about this idea of the indicative target date, which is really interesting because, as you said, you're not a proponent of this. You have to defend it now on stage no, with the group yeah. discussed. Can I take look my at him, Look at him. Yeah, yeah, there's a proponent. <laughs> yeah, I think Sergeant can bring But I'll give to... Uh, you don't trust her, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but he should reflect the idea. Come on. So my, my question is basically, wouldn't this idea leave the pressure with the EU mostly? Because if the date is missed, then the EU can be blamed no, for it. No, it would not. It would be, it would set a positive agenda and it would create pressure on the governments in the region to actually deliver because we're not asking for the ticking the boxes in this case. I mean, I'm, I'll let it go now to Surgeon, but I think that even if it becomes 2037 or the next uh, um, financial framework, there is a need to get also the elephant going back to the elephant in the room. There is a need to get the elephant in the outside of the room that this is unachievable. And this goes back to what Jana said in terms of the distrust in the process. So setting a positive agenda with an indicative target, that's why I said not an accession date, an indicative date that this can be feasible and done within two cycles of one normal exactly government. It's an indicative date. My English is not well enough. I don't understand this. If you do your work, let's say North Macedonia, and I'll set this 2030, it is feasible theoretically that one can end the, the accession negotiations by 2030. Rather than going back to what Juncker said in 2014, we will not have enlargement because the alternative is that one. This is not feasible within the next financial cycle. Sir John, before he starts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly, and then Manuel can answer. A, a preemptive, preemptive attack. <laughs> no, the, the, the idea is, is not original. I mean, it's, uh, it's something that... It's not on you, I reckon. No, it's not. Somehow, I it's, uh, it's, a, it's an idea that was borrowed from the previous wave of enlargement. In early 90s, there was a, an Agenda 2000. That was a sort of a framework for the accession of the Eastern and... Uh, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, Central European countries to the EU. And guess what? Nobody joined in 2000. So it's, it's, but it was a very valuable target date for the government to commit themselves and for the EU to build up what is known as a absorption capacity for the new member states. And um, I wrote a small blog on, on this issue where, I, where I'm arguing that the next year uh, marking a 20th anniversary of Thessaloniki is a perfect opportunity to create a new architecture, not only for the EU, but for Europe. 
uh, including the Eastern Partnership countries, or rather new, new candidates, where this document would be a common agenda, a joint agenda, where the EU will commit itself to produce the required reforms to absorb the new countries, to create an area of European sovereignty against all the challenges coming from the outside. At the same time, recommitting the, the, the ca uh, candidate countries to do their homework. Uh, upon this agenda, you will have a, a stronger leverage that could be paired with the incentives for, for those who deliver and to penalize those who are lagging behind. So basically putting in force what you have as a, um, how do you call it, revised uh, methodology or even application of the, these innovative approaches that among the others, the stage accession that was produced by European Policy Center and SEPs from, from Brussels. Uh, as, as simple as that. I think the time is ripe. I think strategically, strategic importance of such a common European agenda is of the uh, essence for the future of Europe. And if we do not understand that at this particular historical moment in time of this continent, I think we are in the wrong way and that we are already late. And this is why, uh, um, as I said in, in session where I was participating, uh, we are not prophesying doom and gloom. We are just reacting to the reality that we are currently living in uh, in, in, in our region. We are being very realistic. And Manuel, you know that uh, th there's no need to, to explain that to, to yourself, obviously. And Frederic, who is a great, great friend uh, of the region, uh, obviously, uh, as well. Thank you, Sirjan. And um, I give the word to Manuel to respond. Um. Everybody's doing this when leaving the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I dropped the mic. <laughs> uh, I think, if I remember right, in the end of 2002, the date 2004 was given, but the 1st January. <laughs> And in the end, it was the 1st of May. And if I remember right in my historical remembering, I was really young then, oh, not so young, but I think I was really young. Um, if we waited one year longer, the Poles would have said, fuck you. Sorry for this wording. Um, because it was the last moment of the right time for the Eastern enlargement. Um, but in 1999, uh, the Greeks were threatening with a veto to all other enlargement states if we don't change our wording on Cyprus. Do you remember? So, this was the reality. I think their main... Diff I like sticking to the old way of enlargement because this was my young times. I like Kaczynski and Orban. They remember the 70s. I remember the 90s. I still had hairs. And I should talk 10 more minutes. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, so you, you got me to a point, but um, I think there are also differences. And the difference is each Polish government, I mean, in, in the 90s in Poland, it was in the way that all parties in parliament in the next elections, they were all pushed out of parliament. Everybody who didn't deliver what the EU wanted was immediately just sacked by people. And this is the difference. And the difference is also our fault from European Union. But to, I, I really believe that a lot of the old logics works. But this, um, this incentive that the society is so massively asking for deliver what Europe wants, whatever it is, because we are credible, they are not. This is not there anymore. Perhaps to a certain extent in Kosovo, um, with a different meaning otherwise. But I remember, you know, each Polish taxi driver would say, these shitty politicians in Warsaw give the power to Brussels to not have it in Warsaw. Today, this is, by the way, different there <laughs> in parts. But this is, this is our problem. I think this is the key problem. And of course, this is the key problem of this 20 years. Yeah. I'm right. But I somehow don't believe that giving uh, this kind of date will change this problem. I think perhaps we have to go even a longer way around by empowering the people uh, to um, uh, be critical to own politicians better again. And this is, of course, also media freedom. Um, yeah, so this is what my spontaneous reaction, which is hopefully, hopefully showing that we are on one page regarding the assessment and the big story. 
the big story, just I don't have a good tool as well. I just think that delivering to bring the credibility back is anyway is anyway key. This is one of the diplomatic English words. It is key to, yeah. So unfortunately, our time is running out, um, and I'm not so sure, Man Manuel, when you have to jump out. Um, I have to jump out when it's ready. Just my following meeting will be really, really angry. <laughs> okay, so, so we are going to be very fast for a last round, um, and I would love to start with you. Um, with regard to the Berlin process, how would you define that this year is going to be a success? If you look back at the process this year, in a year from now, when would it have been a success in your mind? Uh, it would have been a success if we reached only 30% of what we will reach tomorrow. Oh. All and right. uh, of course, now you should take, I mean, also, I mean, what we learned from the Chinese in Corona, I mean, they uh, actually, we paid for even the transport of the, from us paid uh, whatever stuff and they made a great propaganda of it. So mm -hmm. shall I say no, no, let's be shy, no. It's not a good idea to be shy on the Western Balkans, right? Do you know anybody who's politically successful in the Western Balkans who is shy? Okay, like in other countries perhaps, I don't know any, but Germans think about themselves it would be working here, yeah? Uh, no, but I think um, nobody expected us to get the six uh, getting these agreements done. And although I also think that with critical civil society, it is not easy to play that just signing it, everything is done. This is your job. I think our job is to say, hey, this is showing that the region can agree on stuff and that the game is not over, it's not done. And um, there was a positive atmosphere in that and we will try to use this for more um, if possible. And I mean, of course, positive atmosphere is usually some of an ending, but until then, we try to bring uh, as much sheep as possible to the shed, into the dry. And also, I believe that, um, I mean, the real answer is, of course, nobody knows how this war ends. But the real answer to all questions of credibility of European Union as well, by the way, is, of course, also fought out in Ukraine, um, which is not to underestimate. But, you know, thinking in also the energy solidarity question, thinking in building in this moment now, in this historical moment now, structures which last. By the way, also the Youth Culture Fund, mm -hmm. which can be not easily deleted and which as a structure might be a burden for those who want to get rid of all this and go back to stupid right-wing nationalism or perhaps even left-wing nationalism. Um, this is the idea. So, and I'm sure that what we reach tomorrow will be, even in a bad case scenario, an obstacle for those who want to do real bad stuff there. And of course, it is only three agreements and it's not the work done and it's not ready implemented. Um, but it's so great that we can talk about the question of implementation and getting more, right? Absolutely. Simonina, if you were in the driving seat and you decided what to change about the Berlin process, what would be the one thing that you would change? I would go back to the involvement of the other member states more than what we saw so far. Because I think that from this one we saw a lot of commitment. But going back to what we discussed this morning also in the groups, I would engage, I would strongly engage more, possibly our counterparts that uh, had to leave the session early. And Albert, what would you keep in the Berlin process, which you really, really like, and what would you... Raiko. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, that is too, too, too much of an easy answer. <laughs> I mean, for, for, for us, it is important for youth to be part of the process, Berlin process, all the time. And not just part, but be also a topic, or, or, or uh, as uh, Simonida said, complementary part of all other activities that are done around it. This is the most important thing. And, the th and what, what was the second? What would you change? Ah, what would... <laughs> uh, I think it is, it is related to what I already said, the more the, uh, the renewal of political will of our politicians in this process. We need them again to commit again to give trust to the Berlin process and to their friends that are helping them in direction of cooperation. And Jana, what would you keep, what would you change? 
Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, it's difficult for me to judge this, but uh, what I think should change and what I see as the biggest obstacle now when we are discussing enlargement is actually the coordination. And what I would like to see more of would be uh, either new member states being on board and um, participating in the Berlin process, or at least some more coordination between the Berlin process uh, countries with uh, other EU member states, for example, now under the Czech EU presidency or other countries apart from Czech Republic who are supportive uh, of enlargement and who are friends of the Western Balkan leader, uh, region. So that's something that I would like to see more of. Thank you so much. I think this almost concludes our panel huh? Yes. and our conference. Yes. But it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, luckily. Um, so th thank you very much for this panel and thank you all very much for this great conference. It was really a, a tremendous pleasure working uh, with all of you through the past weeks uh, before the preparatory workshop and uh, up until this conference when we reached these recommendations and these results. And um, it was a, a very nice occasion of meeting everybody finally again after these two years of the pandemic. And um, yeah, even though the, the conference surely, or the preparation of the conference uh, surely has uh, cost me some additional gray hair. <laughs> and, uh, I, I think many members of our teams too. <laughs> um, it was also a great experience of working together and um, a really great team effort of uh, the Southeast Europe Association and Aspen uh, to finalize this project. Um, and we also certainly thank the, uh, our foreign office, Auswärtiges uh, Amt, um, for the strong support um, of this process. But we especially thank our team. And this is the moment when the team should come all up here so that you um, can give them a big, big applause. There they are, they are the real stars of this process. And, and now we do something very, very quick so that we uh, don't take up too much of Manuel's time. We will do a complete group picture. So come on up very, very fast. I know we didn't talk about this. I, we just changed uh, course. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, creating some, <laughs> some of a challenge, but we need to have a picture um, of the group overall. <laughs> How do you want us? <laughs>